With their films, audiences are taken on a weird journey. There's a high-speed pursuit, ends here, and then this execution type deal. It's not so much that it's funny, it's just that it's right. You were having sex with a little fella then? Uh-huh. It's a truth can be stranger than fiction kind of story. It's a battle between good and evil. Fargo changed my life. I'm cooperating here. I'm so proud of you, Norm. It is important to step out sometime and see ordinary people trying to lead ordinary lives. takes place in North Dakota, Minnesota. We grew up in Minneapolis. We were familiar with the area that it happened in and thought it was an interesting opportunity to sort of uh, make a movie about the upper Midwest. <laughs> what you watching there? Go first. The real sort of strong memories that I have from my childhood is, you know, my mother kicking me out of the house when it was 20 degrees below zero to play and then expecting me to horse around in this sort of blank white landscape. It's like Siberia, except you have family restaurants there. <laughs> it's Siberia with family restaurants, exactly. You ever been to Minneapolis? Nope. Personally going back there again, that was a little bit odd. A lot of ways, going back to Minneapolis was like going to a strange city because it's changed so much in that many years. And in other ways, it was sort of oddly familiar. So where are you girls from? Chaska, Lesueur. I've always found that whole part of the country, the whole spine of the country, from the Great Lakes going down through Chicago. It seems to me that if you want to find America, that's where it is. And it just seems so appealing. They seem like Norman Rockwell to me. Love you, Margie. Love you, hon. Given Joel and Ethan's temperament and eccentricities, it must have seemed like a looming threat to them as children in Minneapolis, that, that feeling of people being nice to them. How you doing? Real good. How are you doing today, ma'am? I'm doing really super there. Thanks. It's called Minnesota Nice. It, it is very true that it's a very polite culture. How was everything today? Yeah, real good now. How do you get four uh, drunken Minnesotans out of the pool? You say, excuse me, could you folks get out of the pool? I'm sure sorry. Shep told me 8.30. It was a mix-up, I guess. Minnesota Nice is that politeness that is bred in from childhood. Well, I'm sorry, sir, we still got to charge you the $4. Which isn't to say there's no hostility, it's just that if there is, it's being covered by the politeness. OK, are you sure? Polite cultures are usually the most repressed and therefore the most violent. I guess we were about three weeks into the shooting when I said, uh, tell me a little bit about the, um, the case, the actual case. And they said, no, it's, it's, it's just made up. I said, no, but I mean, you know, the one, the, the story that it's based on. He says it's not based on any story. It's, we just made it up. I said, guys, it says at the beginning of the script, based on a true story. I said, yeah, no, it's not. I said, you can't do that. They said, why not? I said, because it's, you're, you're saying something is not true. I said, the whole movie's not true. We made it all up. It's a movie. It's, it's not true. I said, uh, uh okay okay it was was so calculated it was calculated to see okay if an audience thinks this is true will they go with it longer will they make more leaps of faith and so to a certain extent i think they were thinking well if we could get away with that i mean could we get away with that they were the ones who looked at it and said you know let's poke a hole in this true story balloon it is a true story but it might not have happened they have sort of taken their years of growing up in Minnesota. Then maybe stories they heard later on when they moved to New York, they put it all together like one event, like an autobiography. I asked about the wood chipper, and they said, well, actually, that was a killing with the wood chipper. It's bizarre. And then I got an information. It's not the first one. There's, you know, there's been like 63. So there is a marge somewhere up there. Yeah. <laughs> That's me. There's a, a flow and a rhythm to the way they write that it's just, it's music. Said these two had company. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think that was always a music of the script. They, it was just built in. 
you know, down to every ya. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah. There's scenes where all I say is ya. Yeah. Oh, you betcha, yeah. Yeah. By and large, every word I said, they wrote. Well, that's, that's, I'm not gonna get into, into, see, I just need the money. All the firm thing around, all the broken sentences, the cutting back on yourself. They wrote it. They wrote every word of it. Yeah, no, I'm kind of, I'm uh, kind of busy here. One of my first lines were, where is the pancakes house? Where is pancakes house? Well, it's got to be pancake house. And then when we're doing the scene, I say, where's the pancake house? And Ethan, Peter, yeah, what were you saying there? Where's the pancake house? No, it says pancakes house. Oh, I thought it was a typo. No, no, there's no typos in our scripts. I think Joel and Ethan write characters, and there's a thin line between that and caricature. You were such a super lady. And then, <laughs> I've been so lonely. I was originally called in to read for the state trooper, and there was the usual cast of characters there. Every time an actor auditions, you, you see the same people over and over again. Guys that look remarkably or exactly like you. And I guess Joel and Ethan liked my accent. They said, do you want to read for their Lundergaard part? And I said, oh yeah. So I went out in the hall, worked on it. They said, that's real good. That's real good. You want to work on it tonight and come back tomorrow? I said, yes, I would. So I was up all night. I went in the next day. I read. They said, yeah, that's real good. That's real good. And then uh, later I found out they were still auditioning in New York, so I flew to New York and read for them a third time. That's a very dicey thing for an actor to do, to impose himself upon people who are casting. I thought if I alienate them, so be it, but I've got to play every card that I've been dealt to see if I can get this role. And I was born to play it. I'm uh, Jerry Lundegaard. From my point of view, the guy's as stupid as a bag of rocks. Everything he touched, just went to hell. You know, he's the classic kind of schmuck. schmuck. The, yeah, he's a numbnuts. He's a bit of a numbnuts, Bill. You yeah, know, he's... fortunately, Bill embraced that. That's sometimes a difficult thing with actors is they don't want to think of their characters as being or... not too swift. I really appreciated that he never gave up. Every time something untoward would happen, he would think about it and then make a new plan and move on. Well, heck, if you wanna, if you wanna play games here, I'm working with you on this thing here, but. His attitude okay. was, this is going to work out. I know it's all going to work out. I just have to figure out how. My father was a Kiwanian, and so he sent five years perfect attendance button and a lot of that Kiwanis stuff. I've talked to friends of mine who found themselves horrified watching me in the film because they liked me and they found themselves rooting for me. and. He's really not a very nice man. As scary as he is, he's a very, very recognizable character. The story they were telling about Jerry Lundegaard's character was one that was just a little too hard for an audience member to give, give in to. And I think a lot of people forget that Marge comes in halfway through the movie and that, in fact, it's a supporting role. Hi, it's Marge. I met Joel and Ethan at the audition for Blood Simple in 1982. I've known them for 18 years, and I don't know when they started writing Fargo, but when they did, they said, there's a part for you in it that we want you to play. And then when I read the script, you know, it was like, okay, all right, Marge, all right, I, Midwestern cop. Uh, it was not that interesting at first for me. At the time, I thought, psychopath a killer, a whore, something with a little more meat to it. And it wasn't until I really got into the process that I realized how much fun I was going to have. Mary Zofries, who the, was the costume designer and has been on several of their movies, a friend of hers was six months pregnant, and she fashioned the pregnancy pillow from pictures of the woman. It was a beautiful thing. Zipped me right into it. It was kind of like a whole little onesie. Had the boobs and the stomach and everything. Had the padding on here. And it was full of uh, birdseed so that it had a little more weight to it. I, I made a conscious effort not to move as a pregnant woman. But it was just kind of built in. And there was the role. There was the combination of me and the character at, at a specific time in my life. But there was also the, what the audience brought to it. They were ready for somebody like Marge. They were interested in somebody like Marge. And here you are. And it's a beautiful day. 
what comes through the movie is Marge. It's like a rock. This is the soul up there, and this is something they consider to be very beautiful. So much of the character of Marge Gunderson relies on the partnership between she and Norm. Gotta eat a breakfast. They're this amazing unit, and this idea that they have a great relationship. And there's no mystery there, really, but an amazing sense of how well it works. People don't much use the three cent. Oh, for peace, of course they do. Whenever they raise the postage, people need the little stamps. And that you can laugh at the Midwest, and you can think of it as simplistic, but there, there are couples out there that are like that. You got Arby's all over me. Both Marge and Norm kind of gave an audience a safe haven. I'm turning in, Norm. Oh, yeah? And often, Joel and Ethan don't give audiences that in their movies. They don't give them a safe place to hang out and, and relax. I, I didn't really know the impact that she would have, and I'm not sure that anybody did. I think that during filming, we were all much more interested in, um, you know, Buscemi and Stromar's characters. We can stop, get pancakes, and then we'll get laid, all right? They really became the life of the shoot, in a way. It was kind of like, what are they going to do next, those wacky guys? I'm Carl Showalter. This is my associate, Georg Grimsrud. They're both pretty lovable, aren't they? <laughs> Just a couple of knuckleheads. I've been sitting here an hour. He's peed three times already. Yeah, Carl and Gare kind of have a dysfunctional relationship, but uh, for some reason, they just, they just are together. It was a nice opportunity, as far as Steve's character is concerned, to give Steve a part that was more substantial than what we've given him in the past. I mean, we've worked with him before on three movies, but they've all been very small parts. I think if you totaled my number of working days on all three of those films, it would, it would add up to about a week. I was just thinking we could take care of it right here in Brainerd. You know, I guess from the first time we met him, we thought, you know, this guy would be a good blabberbot. It's the IDS building, the big glass one, the tallest skyscraper in the Midwest after the uh, Sears and uh, Chicago or John Hancock building, whatever. In real life, he's, he's not a blabbermouth at all. Well, that's always an interesting dynamic, the character who talks a lot and the character who says nothing. Would it kill you to say something? I did. I had been in New York with the Swedish National Theater performance of Hamlet. I, I did Hamlet, sold out because it was a Bergman thing, and I think Ethan saw the production, you know, and they said, hey, we're going to do a movie called Nose Crossing, so... We want you in it. We're going to write a special part for you called Swede. So I went back to the National Theater. We went back home. I went up to the boss of the theater and I said, Hey, I'm, I'm having three weeks in New Orleans with the Coen brothers, you know. Mill is crossing. Here's a script. It's Hollywood, man. And he said, Peter, shut up. You know, you ain't going to Hollywood. So finally I got out of that and I was doing a play at the public theater called The Swan. And I had long hair that was bleached. I was blessed to have Frances McDormand on stage doing the play with me. And thank God her husband, Joel Cohn, came with Ethan to see the play. And I said, that's the sweet again. You know, we met two years ago. You didn't want to be in Miller's Crossing. You was shit. Yes, I wanted, but I couldn't get, you know, I couldn't get a leave. Then after a couple of months, they came around saying again, now we have another part. Are you going to turn us down or can we send you a script? They send me the script. I said, Where the hell is the part? You know, like, no lines at all. Are we square? Yeah, you fucking mute. You hardly spoke. Mm. Uh, damn it, I want to be a part of this thing. I had a great time with Harp. During uh, the shooting, someone came up with one of his albums, which we all had a great laugh over and busted him on. We hadn't seen him in movies. He hadn't been in movies for quite a while. Harv is just a really friendly, very generous guy, but he's a very expansive personality. And what we were trying to do was get him to play this character that's a really expansive personality, but a real son of a bitch. This could work out real good for me and Gene and Scotty. Gene and Scotty never have to worry. Marge was the most pronounced accent. Oh, Jeannie, two more of those skins, oh, softly. Generations of her family came from there. So she wore it as a badge of authenticity. I was trying to make it authentic. Hi. Yeah? Prowler needs a jump. 
I worked with a really wonderful dialect coach, Liz Himmelstein, who is great because she just doesn't work with the technique of a dialect, she works with the character of a dialect. Do you hear the one about the guy who couldn't afford personalized plates, so he went and changed his name to J3L2404? We really worked on how it could come out of me through the script and then become Marge Gunderson. They sent along a tape of the Fargo accent. Oh, Norm, you see, if we got the shack out on the ice, then we could catch us some nice walleye for supper. Because the regional part of it was important to us, where the story takes place, it was important to get the whole sort of snow aesthetic. Well, normally, that time of the year, Minneapolis is so cold that the witch's tits call in sick. Looks like she's going to turn cold tomorrow. Oh, yeah. We just happened to hit the winter thaw. So there wasn't any snow, and they were freaking out. We just happened to be shooting in Minnesota in the second warmest year in the last hundred years, and probably the driest. So we ended up making snow at night and trucking snow in. Big dump trucks with the snow would come and, and throwing snow around. And they actually went up almost to Fargo to find that scene where Steve is burying the money in the snow. Normally that time of year, he would have been uh, over waist deep in snow slogging through it. And they, they found about that much snow. That's all they could come up with. And action. Crew members work with them because they feel like it's their movie, not just because they've got a mortgage to pay. They're not going to pay their mortgage by working until Ethan. They'll pay their phone bill, maybe. But you know, it was ours. It was ours. It's like you get back together with all these guys that you've worked with for years, and it just makes that kind of collaboration very easy. They're very calm, and uh, they're also a good audience. Step out of the car, please, sir. Which is great for an actor. I mean, a couple of times I've actually heard them laughing. <laughs> during a scene. <laughs> Joel and Ethan have a very strange collective laugh. And I, we call it, it's the Cohen laugh. Their father kind of laughs like that, and our son has picked it up. It's a little scary. But it's not really a laugh, and it's not a giggle. It's kind of what would be like a guffaw. And it's... <laughs> <laughs> and they get going together. <laughs> They seem like two stoners that someone gave a couple of million dollars with in a camera and said, go make a movie. And uh, they're just so laid back. They're so un-Hollywood. We'd finish a take. They'd come up going, that is really good. That is really good. I like the part where you went blah, 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 blah. That is really good. Yeah. Yeah. You want to do it again? Let's do it again. The woodchipper scene was got there early morning. And the special effects is set up the woodchipper. So let's take this one take. This comes burning out like Okay, they worked on it, you know, for 20 minutes. Darn cold. Okay, let's do it again. Now it works. Now it works. Usually people throw big fits, you know. But they just said, guys, do it. We do it tomorrow. Let's shoot the other scene. There's a shot of me doodling. And I was just waiting during setups and I was doodling and, and Ethan walked behind me and saw what I was doing, which was just squiggles as I remember it. But he said, that's great, we got to get a shot of that. They can both um, give directions to, to the actors or to, to Roger, the DP, and they don't really trip each other up. If you can't find Joel, you can always ask Ethan and vice versa. Both the crew and the cast were people that we knew and had worked with before. We are directing the movie, and but the nature of our collaboration isn't that different from the nature of our collaboration with Roger or the designer or anyone else is something where we get together, we discuss how we want things to be. If there's a difference of opinion, it gets argued out or discussed out until one sort of point of view prevails. They wanted that stark landscape. They wanted that kind of flat white world. And I think that that really is evident in the overhead shot of the the parking lot in the snow and how geometric it is and the, that lone figure, tiny little figure walking out to the car. It was obvious that it was supposed to be set in that, in that location, but it was also a technical visual thing. With Roger Deakins, their cinematographer they've worked with a lot, it was what they continued to do with Oh Brother and then with The Man Who Wasn't There. It was a work towards black and white. It was sepia, it was shades of gray, white, brown. There were 1.4 million Swedes immigrated, and today we're 14 millions up there. For me, it it's a, was a time travel, being Scandinavian to go up there. And so whenever I had the time, I drove around 
We used to go on little trips on our days off because he would look on the map and he'd say, Stockholm. And he goes, oh, we have to go to Stockholm. We have to see what it's like. And we'd drive and drive and drive and there'd be a post office and that would be it. Or we'd go to other little towns and it would have a big welcome sign at the beginning of the town in Swedish, welcoming you in for the pancakes and the, you know, the grog. It's more Sweden than Sweden. There's no town in Sweden that has portraits of the king and queen in, in the shop window or in the diner. I met a lot of Swedes up there that never been in Sweden. I met an old man, he spoke with a very special dialect, and I said, I know where you're coming from, and you're from S Skara in Sweden, or Boro. And he started to cry, and he said, yes, that's where my grandparents came from. That's how I learned the language. I actually cried a lot of times because you see, you know, the tombstones and it says in Swedish, I left my home country, now I'm safe in the hands of Jesus. They happened to use a device of, of screen violence in a really balletic way. They somehow made it a vernacular of their storytelling in a way that you just kind of come to expect it. And there's very little that's more dramatic than murder, than death. That's about as dramatic as you can get. I'm okay with the violence in Fargo because I find that it's all true. It is funny sometimes, but you're laughing out of discomfort. The humor in it is, you know, sometimes dark. Um, but it always comes from situations and from the characters. It's got these opposites. On one hand, it has the look and feel of a gentle movie. The way they deal with all the characters is so gentle. Even Stramar and uh, Steve Buscemi are dealt with with such a, a light touch and such affection. <laughs> so it's a gentle touch on a vicious story. Oh, it's Marvel. Yeah, real good. I think the film, when it came out, was uh, sort of billed as a, a film about Minnesota. Um, and I think a lot of Minnesotans got kind of excited about that. Ah, let's see what, what it's all about. And so when it was really a, a relatively ugly story, um, and with us imitating the accents, I think a lot of them thought we were making fun of them. What the heck are you talking about? You know, they'd come up and they'd say, you know, you make it sound like we all talk like that, and it's just not true, you know. Yeah, well, that was a mix-up then. Yeah, you already said that. Yeah. I found the whole uh, award phenomena with Fargo fascinating. We all did. We'd already celebrated the movie so much because we never expected it to have the audience it did. Getting nominated, uh, as you can imagine, just changed my whole life. And I had a, a sense that I was leaving a part of my life behind and going into a new part of my life. I didn't know until Billy Crystal made fun of us at the award ceremony that we were the outsiders. He stood up there and he looked down at me and he goes, who are you people? The Oscar contending movies were always big studio films, that there was a, 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 a global change had happened that year. I knew if I had the opportunity to get up on that stage in front of that many people, I had a few things I wanted to say. <laughs> and that, that I mostly wanted them to be aware of and kind of publicly acknowledge that Joel and Ethan and most of us that work with them have and had been doing it independently from a certain system, and I don't mean through studios or through Hollywood, but independent in choices. Joel and Ethan have always had final cut of their film. They've always had complete control of the filmmaking, creative aspect of everything they've done, and have sacrificed financial gain to, to have that. The doors opens when, when you work with the Coen brothers, and that is how prestigious they are to this industry. People don't want me to do the, the the dialect so much, but they surely want to do it back to me. The heck do you mean? The heck do you mean? I, I guess it's best epitomized by this guy that walked up and he said, my son wants to say something to you. And this kid was only about seven years old. And what the hell he seen Fargo for? And he said, my, my son wants to say something to you. And the kid came up and he was sort of shy. And I said, hi, how are you? What did you want to say? And he goes, I'm cooperating here. I'm cooperating here. I don't talk that way. I, I say I can't do it without the wig. 
which is true. It's kind of a whole, you know, it's a whole package. I want you to tell me what these fellas look like. Well, the little guy, he was kind of funny looking. In what way? I don't know, just funny looking. Can you be any more specific? It's extraordinary how many people have memorized lines from Joel and Ethan's movies. You have no call to get snippy with me. I'm just doing my job here. The stories and the tragedies, like the Japanese woman who still believed there was money out there. I mean, on, on one hand, it's it's as absurd and bizarre and tragically comic as the, as the film is. But it's a sad thing. It's a sad thing that anybody has that kind of need and takes it so far and then actually loses their life because of it. It's horrible. And then after the movie was out for a while, there was this great article in the Post saying, we've just discovered that it wasn't based on a true story. And Joel and Ethan wrote a letter to the paper saying, we're doing an internal investigation to find out how something like this could have happened. Please trust us. There will be personnel changes. And we want to assure our public they can count on us for quality entertainment in the future. And we will take steps to make sure that something like this never happens again. <laughs>